Hello everyone and welcome back to the Brightworks, another match of Beyond All Reason. Woke up today with the most terrible migraine I've had in a good long while, so we're gonna take a, uh, a relaxing view at this game today on Cilia and Charybdis. Spawning on the southern side here. And representing the blue team is a Cortex commander and apparently planning to go into vehicles, and I think that makes a whole lot of sense. A commander that goes by the name of Duck Viking. Love that name, right? So myself, the uh, Vikings have always been an imagery that I associate with. I absolutely just love the uh, Nordic inspirations. How to Train Your Dragon, one of my favorite movie series of all times, my favorite uh, animated movie series of all times, especially the second one. I really feel like that one, the, the curve for How to Train Your Dragon's movies was basically like that, with this being the first one, this being the uh, the second one, and this being the third one. Uh, we're a little off topic already, but all the way across the map here, spawning in the back line for the red team, Leline, Leela, going to be showing us what she's got here. Also a Cortex Commander, also going into vehicles. I'd be surprised if we see too many bots on this uh, matchup today. Yeah, indeed, we do see vehicles pretty much across the board right here from a lot of the red players. Looks like our Orange Commander, Clean C, is going to be going for some bots. And uh, Stubby over here, not Cortex, but Armada, and also going to be going for vehicles. What about the front line over here for the blue team? We do have one bot player, of vehicles, uh, another bot player. Okay, interesting. We do have a little bit of variance here. Okay, actually more bot players than vehicle players on the front line for the blue team. Should be interesting to see how that lines up. Cilia and Charybdis, one of those maps that vehicles really shine on just because there's all these big pathways that are available that just really uh, accentuate the advantage that those vehicles have on flat open terrain. Not going to be surprised if we see a whole lot of Blitz play, a whole lot of Incisor play, a lot of those super fast, super mobile tanks that are able to sneak into back lines and punch pretty hard at the enemy economy, if they get the opportunity. Already quite a few rovers across the map here. Very nicely done by Yam1. Going to be trying to sneak a couple of these rovers over onto the other side of the map, though at the very least find Tortoise's base. Maybe they'll even snipe a couple of mexes or some other economy here from Layla. We'll just have to see how much these rovers can do. There is a tan rover, uh, rascal rather, moving across the map here as well. Just a single one and it is spotted, so at the very least, shouldn't be too hard to deflect this with just a little bit of effort. Uh, yeah, these rovers over here stopped for a good second or two. There we go. Incisor is out on the field and that'll be quite nice. Ooh, for deflecting. Never mind. <laughs> LLT in the main base is going to be quite good at defending, but uh, the incisor pulled to the front. I'm a little surprised by that. I would have expected we would use that in the back line for defense here. At the very least, his LLT is really nicely positioned here. So at the very uh, meanwhile, yeah, Tortoise is not going to have too much trouble here. Yeah, Rascal a little bit better than the Rover. It's uh, it's one of those weird mismatches there. They're, they should fundamentally be the same unit. However, uh, just in practice, for whatever reason, the Rascal tends to be a little bit better. Well, I could explain it. It's a little bit technical, but essentially the way that the Rascal maneuvers its weapon around is a little bit different than the Rovers, which is mounted on the rear. And it doesn't make that much of a difference in the grand scheme of things, but it can mean that the uh, Rascal, when up against Rovers, can be a little bit more effective. Rascal down here that managed to snipe a metal extractor will go down. Hopefully we rebuild that metal extractor here from Duck Viking. There we go. We do have it queued up right now. Good to see. Getting those metal extractors back up and running as soon as possible is definitely very important. Stubby pushing pretty far forward here, but Z-Pod up to meet the uh, pink commander that he's going to be going up against. Love to see that. Yeah, good aggression across the field right now from everybody. The middle of the map looking a little bit slower than everybody else. We do have that bot start, so I'm a little surprised about that. I really feel like sending the commander forward right now might not be the worst idea since we already have two constructors out. These can help with building the base. They can help with building energy, all that good stuff. Oh, no, instead we're going to send the constructors forward. Interesting. A little bit of a different take on the uh, start here for Bronze Age Chad. Notable, however, is that Bronze Age Chad does have 17 true skill and... Uh, a single chevron, which does indicate that this is a brand spanking new player. The, I wonder if that red hue on that uh, that 17 true skill indicates an uncertainty factor. One of the numbers that's used to gauge uh, sort of your, you know, relative skill level in the game. But uh, yeah, no, what, what this says to me is that Bronze Age Chad is a little bit newer to the game here. Maybe a little unfamiliar with just how powerful the commander can be walking forward and claiming these metal extractors. Hopefully we see some help from the blue team, recognizing that, hey, one of their players is a little new and offering some advice here. I have a Brute and an Iron Deficiency. Yeah, that's uh, pretty fair. <laughs> the Brutes are quite expensive. You can see that wreckage is 141, but to actually build a Brute costs 235 metal. Quite expensive for an early game economy. I mean, that's already over 20% of your, er your early game economy, your starting economy here. 
And this is exactly what I was talking about. A couple of incisors here and there are going to be able to slip by and do a little bit of damage. It's not monumental, but it is cumulative, and eventually it's going to add up to a nice little advantage here for Zeberg, who is going up against effectively no opponent for the time being. Bronze Age Chad trying to pump out these units right now. Doesn't know about construction turrets. What you want to do, in case you're watching out there, Bronze Age Chad, this is for you. You either want to take these when times when power is high. You want to take your T1 constructors, hit V and then A to select the construction turret. Plop down two, three, or four of these bad boys and they'll help out your uh, factory right here. You'll start producing a whole bunch of units. Or you can lock your commander or any constructor on there. There we go. Yeah, Bronze Age Chad, well aware of what should be going on. Very good indeed. Yeah, a bunch of those maces are going to be coming up here. They're very slow though, so they're going to have a hard time catching up against the incisors or blitzes should those come out as well. Wow, these incisors are actually having a field day on this army. Excellent engagement right there. The shape of that engagement was a beautiful concave moving in against a straight line. Those units were moving across like this, meaning that that was a really efficient trade right there. You can see two incisors went down for effectively five bots right here as that final pawn does fall. Very nicely done by Zeberg, taking advantage of, well, effectively anything. Whatever, whatever opportunities present themselves here, the yellow commander being sure to lay down the law. We do have a beamer turret coming up here, so that's actually quite nice. The beamer turret can actually lock down a significant portion of this area. Beamer turret's quite effective against pawns, against grunts, against uh, even blitzes and incisors to a lesser degree, but still an effective degree. I definitely like to see it. Shellshocker's trying to obliterate anything that's coming across the map here as well. The purple player firing against the pink. So close in hue that it almost feels like they should be on the same team, but they are not. Juno Minha uh, going up against F F Fausto 8. F F Austo aid. We'll call you sus. Shellshockers here to counter pressure the shellshockers of the opponent. Stubby, love to see it. It's essentially uh, essential. There's a there's a word sandwich for you. Much like the toast sandwich, piece of toast between two slices of bread. Uh, what were we talking about? Shell shockers. They're great. <laughs> they're great because if you're being pressured with shell shockers, obviously it means that you can pressure back the uh, enemy shell shockers. Keeps them off your static defense line. Saves you a little bit of time in the long run. Nice little play right there by Z-Pod, actually. Whether it was intentional or not, throwing up a LLT or just any any building really quickly to bait out the Janus missile, it's a really cheeky way to save your commander if it's being encroached upon by those super heavy Janus tanks. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a cheap little trick, but it can oftentimes save you in a pinch if you really are lacking in resources. Because almost always you can start up a, uh, a hologram, right? Like an image of a... Of a building or whatnot. The Janices are more than happy to shoot at that if they're outside of your commander range. So prioritize the commander if it's within range, but otherwise you can bait out those missiles and save your commander, at least from one volley. Not going to save you all the time. Jan is definitely very difficult to deal with, but uh, just, you know, one more thing to be aware of. Uh, commander sacrifice back here. Going to be going straight into a T2 air lab right now for the gave me fire. I actually like to see it. It's a Cortex T2 air lab, so we're not going to see any of those super OP EMP bombers. We're not going to see any of those uh, really, really powerful uh, Hornet gunships. We might see some Wasps, the uh, Cortex T2 gunship, which is also quite capable. A little bit less capable of dealing with single point heavy units than the uh, Hornet is, but pretty easy to build up in mass and very effective at dealing with runaway T1 units like medium tanks and the like. Yeah, this is pretty much what I expected to see, though. A whole lot of incisors on both sides here, dipping in and out of combat here. The Janus is firing away. Makes a whole lot of sense as well. Just going to be a nice source of single target damage. Uh, although I say single target, it's not like that AoE doesn't absolutely burn anything that gets a little too close to it. Okay, incisors are pulled here. Ah, it feels like the commanders are able to thwart that attack quite nicely, though. Yeah, Z-Pod and Fausto both managed to essentially push back all the forces right there. The Shell Shockers remain intact, and that's kind of the core of this army. The uh, Shell Shockers are really what's actually keeping the threat alive here. The Janices are potent, uh, but as soon, as soon as they fire, I mean, it only takes a single rover or rascal in order to bait out all their shots, and then as soon as they fire, they become effectively useless. This is going to come down to who has better reclaim and who has better resurrection, and right now it does look like Duck Viking has a couple of those resbots out and running. Did we switch into a bot lab? Those, these must have been handed over because we don't have a bot lab out anywhere on the field here for the Blue Commander. Regardless of how the resbots came to be, it's nice to see them on the front lines, patching up a lot of these tanks that really stand to benefit from having that uh, HP regeneration, so to speak, that HP rebuilding. Very good to see. Quite a complicated front right here that the yellow commander is fighting across. We do have a gauntlet up here as well. Okay, so we're going heavily into static defense here for the green commander. Uh, this is something that we do see a lot of new players go for, is a, a whole lot more static defense than ideally you really should. 
it's uh, not. It's 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 really hard to blame new players for making that mistake because it's essentially all the scenarios teach you to do against the AI is build as much static defense as you care for. Against players, it can be easily thwarted. There's essentially the the design behind this game, the balance for this game. I, I only bring this up because I saw some discussion about it in my own Discord, which you can uh, feel free to join, by the way, in the links in the description and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I also saw some, some discussion about it on the Reddit, which was how do you design a base that's foolproof, right, that can't be penetrated? And the design of the game is intentionally opposed to that. There are units for any situation to break any base, whether it's air, sea, uh, or land. There is, there is some way to obliterate any static defense, so ultimately you want units over static defense. It's just kind of something you have to, you know, if you're not comfortable with that sort of style, then it's just something you're going to have to adapt to if you want to get real good at Beyond All Reason. It's a, it's a different, it's a change of mindset, really, more than anything. Not to say that static defense isn't useful. Case in point here, these flamethrower turrets, which I've gained a tremendous appreciation for as of late. Huge amount of DPS that these can put out, especially effective against medium tanks, which is always a really difficult thing to counter in the first place. Loads of brutes are moving forward, and this is so many LLTs, but we don't have the energy for all of these. Yeah, you can see Ianertsen. Yeah, well, the LLT, okay, the LLTs are firing. What a laser. Laser forest right there. Blasting apart these tanks as much as it can. And here are the beamer turrets putting in some good work too. Really fond of the beamer turrets. They can really do some serious work. I like the gauntlet for doing some long-range damage here as well, but I don't think it's really going to save anything over on this side. Yeah, these medium tanks are looking to push forward. I will say the impulse on the gauntlet is quite nice. Being able to stun some of those tanks that it hits. But ultimately, this is just too much damage right here. Yeah, medium tanks getting into the back line. It's only a matter of time before the build power pops here. A couple of those construction bots already go down. We need to take out the build towers. There we go. Energy converters pop. Wind turbines starting to chain reactor as well. They've been spaced out one, though, which does make them resistant to chain reacting, so it's going to be a little bit harder. Reinforcing medium tanks is going to continue pushing through here. Yep. And just like that, we do see one of the blue players wiped out of the game. Indeed. Looks like it was the green player, Bronze Age Chad, who's actually tapped out of the game at this point. My goodness. Yeah, there we go. I entered in the uh, next door neighbor to the green commander actually inherits all that and is going to start trying to recover here. Fiends coming out from the backline are going to do more than enough to clean up all this right here. So as long as we get the metal extractors up and running, not going to be surprised if we're going to be able to recover here. But certainly this is putting the blue team on the back foot. This is exactly the kind of aggression that I love to see. Using your units across the map and making sure that you're going to get some value out of these T1 units. Because as soon as that T2 transition happens, you're going to be obsoleted pretty quick. So if you don't do some eco damage, then you might as well just reclaim your T1 units and turn them into T2. Because they're not going to be very valuable. As soon as they start, for instance, being rained on by Sheldons or Sharpshooters or any of those T2 high damage, high cost units. We even go for the self D here, and yeah, that's exactly the idea, right? You don't want to you, you want to get as much value out without handing over as much of this metal. Unfortunately, that self D command was a little too late here. Those fiends managed to burn all this to cinders, but for the time being, anyway, uh, I, I like the I like the thought process more than the actual execution. Eh, medium tanks here being blasted away by the heavy laser tower. Also quite nice. Those heavy laser towers they've been described as a zoning tool, and I think that's appropriate. They're good for denying specific areas to specific units. Shell Shocker is obviously able to outrange the Heavy Laser Tower. I mean, maybe not obviously. The, the Heavy Laser Tower is pretty powerful for a T1 structure, but uh, certainly does not reign supreme as far as the static con static defense contest goes. Well, the uh, Dragon's Maw over here, quite resistant when it's tucked away in its little shell. We'll love to see... Oh, we do have a construction turret, actually. Yeah, the construction turret can easily repair this up to full health. Those things are so resistant that you really can repair them, which is a single construction turret, and essentially infinitely sustain them against way larger forces than you'd expect. Massive T1 army over here on the left side for Yam-1. I'd love to see these continuing to push forward. There is nothing out right now for the ground commander. We've gone for a whole lot of landmines, so that's awesome to see. Uh, apparently, that's our fallback plan. Now, don't get me wrong, the mine layer actually makes a lot of sense on this map because there's so many strategic points to push through. There's so many open areas to push through. Going for mines actually makes a lot of sense because it's really easy to predict where the enemy is going to start stepping through. And indeed, we do have some landmines set up over here as well. Uh, yeah, you got to be careful about friendly firing landmines. That's the only concern here. 
It is all T1, and man, that construction turret is quite nice here, yeah. This heavy laser tower, despite how much damage it's taking, it won't matter, because as long as it stays up and standing, as long as that construction turret remains standing, this is all just gonna get repaired back up to full health. It's really, really nicely done. Really nicely included by the blue commander to remember to put some build power up there, just to passively keep all this in check. Stebby's commander is on the front line here, actually looking a little bit low on health, 41%. Not terrible, but a little bit risky to keep it out, especially now that we've already seen the T3. We know that the Fiends are out because we saw those tanks encounter them in the back line here. Really tricky because as soon as you see those T2 out on the field, the commanders become extremely vulnerable. There we go. We're finally repairing this uh, heavy laser tower here. Beautifully done. Commander about to be fully repaired as well. Always nice. This is what I'm talking about, though. Those Shell Shockers are raining down on this, and without Shell Shockers to counter push right here for an air... An, in, I, maybe it's Ian, Ian Ertsen. We'll go with Ian Ertsen. Yeah. Without uh, without Shell Shockers to counter the Shell Shockers of the enemy right here, it becomes really tricky to deal with this kind of a thing. The Blitzes are pulled, and they do definitely push that line back, and the medium tanks and the maces and everything else are doing a good job here, but I think eventually all that will be deflected. Heavy Laser Tower, again, excellent zoning tool right here as it blasts away at a whole bunch of these units that stopped because they were fight commanded, and at the end of the day, most of that metal is just going to go on back to Zberg over here. Right hand side is collapsing pretty quickly. We do have Mauser coming out in mass. As soon as those Mauser hit a critical mass, they can start to obliterate that T1 faster than it can push into all this. Commanders over here are also doing great zoning as well, keeping a whole lot of these units back, threatening with those D-guns. Obviously the Janus missiles hurt quite a lot, but not gonna matter too much as long as those commanders can take one or two and then back off to relative safety. There's Quakers out already though. So if anything, the Mauser are just a response, and we need them built up in critical number. I'd love to see them piled up over here and then sent to the front line. Ten Mauser deployed to the front line can be much more effective than a stream of Mauser. You know, one one per ten seconds or so. Oftentimes, that can be enough to overwhelm your enemy, and then you can get a huge counter push, or, uh, as opposed to just slowing down the enemy's push and then still granting them a whole lot of uh, positional advantage. Medium tanks in the back line right here. Duck Viking. Similarly trading out those T1 tanks, realizing it's time to switch up to T2 here. Wouldn't be surprised if we go for our T2 now that our T2 metal extractors are up and running. We do have T1 production in full swing here, but I think it's about time we see a T2 lab. We've already got a whole lot of metal up and running. We don't even have a efficient way to spend it here. So I really like that we're thinking about it at the very least. We need a little more power though. Only 300 energy per second right here for the blue commander. And we ideally want to aim for about 500. It's give or take about the right amount of power you want if you're going to go into T2, but especially if you're going into vehicles, it might be well worth it to invest in quite a bit more. I learned the other day that these mine layers actually have an attack. Yeah, if you hit uh, A to manually attack on the ground, they have a little a little Juno missile thing. Yeah, it's called Mine Sweep. They can actually, essentially the same thing that a Juno can do. Uh, very rare that you get the chance to use one of these, but, you know, for its Mine Sweeper purpose anyway. But uh, yeah, pretty cool to see. Certainly going to be useful if you're pushing into, for instance, a heavily mined area like this. Light mines not necessarily going to obliterate these medium tanks, at least not all at once, but one by one, those light mines do still do quite a bit of damage. Medium, essentially the mines, by the way, correlate to the armor of the vehicle, so light mines good against bots, light infantry. Medium mines good against medium tanks, medium infantry. Heavy mines good against heavy tanks, good against heavy infantry. You know, pretty... Pretty easy to follow that conclusion through to the end there. Did we stopped Mauser production. We did. We went into lightning tank production here. Uh, it's not that I don't like the lightning tanks. Actually, I think there's a lot of value for them, especially if we start using them offensively and we send them across, in, for instance, that direction. Uh, I think we can get a whole lot of value out if we start to do a little bit of damage across the map. Indeed, that actually looks like the idea here. Yeah, 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 go for it. I think if the purple commander sends these lightning tanks across, they're going to bypass all this artillery, force it to turn around, and then that's a great or a great time for the Mauser to roll forward and do a whole bunch of damage to that enemy artillery. Quakers hit so hard nowadays that you really don't want to send your squishy units into that line of fire. You need some way to address this, whether it's cloaked units like spy bots or something to EMP all this, whether it's some air support. Whatever it happens to be, you need some way of addressing that because otherwise pushing into those Quakers is a death sentence really nicely done. Yeah, here we go. Lightning tanks, well, sort of queued forward. We haven't queued them far enough. We need to we need to keep queuing them in the back line. There we go. Always a little bit worried about that, especially when a backline player is doing a run by because you just never know when you're gonna have to deal with something in the back line and then your attention is pulled away. A ping is sent out here. Stubby, pinging the map to uh, alert his teammates. Very nice, though. Oh, keep moving, keep moving. There we go. 
Lightning tanks will eventually, oh, should eventually. <laughs> there we go. Blast down that uh, advanced metal extractor. Really good to see. Those Amexes are producing seven metal a second, so we've already shut down 14 metal per second going into the enemy's economy. I have a feeling we're about to bump it up to 21 here as another Amex goes down. Quaker is caught by these lightning tanks that were caught coming out of the labs. Antinuke is even caught right there. That's actually a little cheeky. We might be able to go into some uh, nuclear shenanigans here. Advanced solar panels also being blasted apart here. The, yeah, the energy stall right here could be really devastating for the pink player. The chain lightning on these can definitely ravage these economies that are close together. Got to be careful about balling up those tanks, but you can see the splits right here have been phenomenal. Medium tank now going into the back line over here for the Maroon Commander as well. So many of these advanced solars are falling here. Beautifully, beautifully done. The other important thing about splitting your troops, of course, is that they get this surround bonus, which is really important. It's about plus 90% damage when you're fully surrounding something. So if you're shooting it from the front and the back directly, it's about a, about a plus 90% bonus. So it is definitely well worth it. Huge amount of damage, though. Yeah, the lab goes down as well over here for the pink commander. You can see that metal slowly creeping up. We do have quite a fabulous economy because we're reclaiming a whole lot of this, but uh, no way to actually spend all that metal, which is really tragic. Constructors are caught here. Oh, no. Okay, we are going to citizens arrest these tanks right here. Very nice. Eventually, those will go down. It's all cleaned up by Agren. A little bit cheeky there. Medium and heavy tanks tried to push through to shut down these Sheldon, but there was just too many of them. Now there's even some static defense on the field. Okay, sure. A little bit of static defense here and there, definitely not the end of the world. Especially the T2 static defense, I like a whole lot more. It's just capable of being more efficient. Right? It, can, it can trade out a whole lot more efficiently. Despite costing more metal, it's going to do more metal in damage, if that makes sense. It'll, it'll peel back the layers of those heavier units a whole lot easier. Shell Shocker's definitely having a hard time against these heavy tanks, though. Not their ideal target. Sheldon gonna have a slightly better time just for their projectile traveling a little quicker and also having more of them. Goes for a whole lot. Do we have any nuclear shenanigans? I do wonder about that. Uh, doesn't look like it. Nobody on the blue team looking to capitalize on thermonuclear warfare here. Nobody on the red team either. I'm just scanning around in the back lines over here just to see what everybody's up to. I do see a couple of Jun Junos over here. Also, Janices. So there have been plenty of Janices, but we also have a couple of Junos. Love to see those. Those are great anti-mine uh, units. We've seen mines be extremely prevalent this entire match, which I love to see. I love the depth of gameplay there to uh, use those mines. A little bit worried about these shell shockers. It would not be too hard for these heavy tanks to push forward. Yeah, I think Agron sees it as well. Hey, wait a second. Is this an entire composition made up of T1 shell shockers? Should be no trouble for two Tigers to push through here and do a whole bunch of damage to. Flame turret being a little bit annoying, actually. Ah, shuriken are pulled. Okay, interesting. Well, you know what? With the assistance of the shuriken, the wolverine become a much more lethal force. Uh, because, of course, shuriken turn mobile units into static units. And static units are absolutely the bread and butter for those wolverine to fire down on. Raining death and destruction from above. Easy to forget when you transition to the T2 tier just how dangerous those shell shockers really are i mean it is a tremendous amount of damage that they can put out especially in large numbers uh, it's just the fact that usually they won't hit anything they'll hit five percent maybe of their shots if they're lucky shurikens though evening the odds here yeah actually making this quite effective huh interesting little composition right there how about an anti-composition it's missile trucks we do have T2 mixed in here, but that Zara is having a field day blasting array that T1 and all those squishy T2. Yeesh. So much metal down the drain as that heavy tank does push forward here. We need some sort of sustain on this tank, so some res bots, some uh, printers if those are enabled right now. Not sure if they are. We'll see. Yeah. Toggle onto that real quick. Cut back to the battle while I switch through these uh, pages over here. No, it looks like we don't have the printer enabled, uh, so that's a little bit of a bummer. I do love the printer. I think it's one of my favorites. But uh, it, it, it just lends so much sustain to any composition because it's just mobile repairing. Not the end of the world, though. A couple of resbots can do effectively the same job, so it's also not like there's not other options. They just require a little bit more micro. Anything to reduce micro, though, I'm pretty much on board for. It's one of the things that Bar has that I think offers above a lot of other uh, RTS titles right now is just the fact that uh, there's so many quality of life things that reduce the amount of micro you have to do. Discovering those can oftentimes be a little tricky, but uh, yeah, using them once you figure them out is usually pretty easy. Rattlesnake was built over here and it's been firing away at a lot of these units. 
actually doing a great job. Just scuffing up a whole lot of these tanks over here, which is really, really nice. Mouths are also firing away as well. We do have a jammer over here, so this jammer is actually really cool. Shutting down a whole lot of those, uh, a whole lot of those vision for the pink team. Pink players and the red team. Uh, persecutor over here as well, that little in-base or in-ground pop-up turret. Sticking its head above water to shoot away at anything they can find over here. Advanced Exploiter also pretty good. Fires those little missiles out of its schnozzle as well. Heavy Laser Tower really stealing the show, though. This really is the trifecta of Cortex Defense, isn't it? You have the Heavy Laser coming from the Advanced Exploiter, you have the Persecutor, and you have the Pop-Up Turret. Pretty much everything you could ask for in a Cortex Defense. We don't have a Bulwark, but effectively those three work together like one. I'm really impressed with the value that these Wolverines have had well into the mid-game here. Typically, those Wolverines tend to be sniped relatively easily by some T1 stuff. We do have Bulwarks over on this side, by the way. Not going to be having any more run-bys happen, apparently. Juno Minal, uh, Minal. Juno, Juno Minha. Juno Minha 1. We'll go with Juno Minha 1. <laughs> Figuring out the names. It's half the fun of these casts. I always love to hear from you guys, by the way. Learning about the different pronunciations for all the names. It's so thrilling. I'm not, uh, I'm not quite skilled enough to learn a new language. I've tried a couple of times, and it's, you know, it's just never stuck with me per, per se, but uh, learning about new languages, definitely love to hear about that. The, uh, I forget the, the term for it, the actual, you know, long, long-winded term for it, but essentially the, the movements of the mouth was one of the things that I really appreciated studying in university uh, as far as linguistics go, because that really defines how a, uh, how a language is spoken. I know this is a weird sidetrack, but uh, it also defines how your accent is spoken. So if you if you speak, for instance, English with an accent, it actually has nothing to do with your pronunciation of the, or nothing nothing to do with your, your way of understanding the language or the language itself. It's actually just entirely has to do with the way that you move your tongue and your lips and your throat in the uh, pronunciation of all the letters. It's a, it's a really mind-blowing sort of subject because once you start realizing that all these things that you just naturally do every single day have words and it really uh i don't know for me it was eye-opening as far as it relates to the game though very small very little <laughs> i just appreciate that bar has such a global community it means that we get a very wide range of experiences from all over the place which is really cool to see hound's doing their very darndest against these medium tanks uh heavy tanks pardon me Quaker doing its very darndest against the hounds, though. So it's a little bit of uh, rock, paper, scissors right there as far as who's solving which problem. Tremors over here have been absolutely monstrous. I love the Tremor. As far as units go, it's got to be one of the most satisfying. Look at this beautiful little schnozzle it has, a little miniature calamity mounted on top of its head. And when it starts to target fire an area, this is the problem with the Tremor. It tries to lock on between different targets and can't fire at its full rate. One of the one of the AI changes that I think would make the Tremor monumentally better is that instead of uh, well, re recently it was changed so that its its targeting box works the way you can see here, where the target selection is the end of the targeting box, then it it fills that little area with fire. The way it used to work was it was central to the to the box essentially. So I'd love to see that implemented again. That way, what the Tremor can do is if it ever uh, if it if it detects a unit in that box, it just fires. That way it's just constantly firing. <laughs> I feel like that's on spirit for the for the tremor. Maybe not though, that would probably break some things. There's a lot of weird constraints. After talking to Hornet and some other developers for a good long while, I've learned that there's quite a lot of engine constraints that have to be worked around, which is a, uh, you know, just one of those things about a, developing a game for years and years and years. Battles raging all across the place here. Yellow Army is looking formidable. That's a lot of Tiger tanks, the uh, T2 heavy tanks. Uh, Tremor in a lot of trouble, though. Yeah, it's taking shots from a Czar, as well as some of those heavy tanks. Down it goes. Ugh, that is expensive. Those Tremors do cost over a grand to build per Tremor. Really, really don't want to lose those. You have to keep those so well protected. Love the res spiders here, though. This is something that I've been including in my compositions recently as well. Super, super happy with the res spiders. How much build power do these have? 150 build power, so almost as much as a butler. I believe that's 30 less than a butler. Is phenomenal. 
That's a crazy, crazy amount of build power right there, which means that they can eat up these corpses extremely fast. You can see while it's reclaiming about 50 metal per second right here. And they have this disdain to actually do it on a complicated T2 battlefield as well, so really, really, really happy with the spiders. I've been playing with them a lot on stream. Definitely an event that if you're looking for obtuse or otherwise interesting games beyond all reason, I definitely recommend you check out. Tuesdays and Saturdays, 12 PDT. Feel free to run the numbers and do the conversion on your own. I don't confuse anybody. But we do have quite a lot of fun. I sure get to uh, enjoy trying out some unique strategies. And uh, you guys do too. As well as all the bizarre settings that we oftentimes play with. Sometimes we get to see some cool stuff that mod makers are working on. Sometimes we get to play around with developers joining us. Flo has joined us a couple of times, Floris, uh, and helps us set up occasionally some of the high high player lobbies. You may have seen a video or two about high play lob high player lobbies during the live streams. It's all thanks to the development team that join in sometimes. I know Ice sticks around sometimes as well to say hi. It's real good fun. Definitely would recommend it. Also a good place to learn the game because uh, I pride myself on having a community that I would say is pretty helpful and willing to uh, willing to coach without too much back sass, right? <laughs> willing to uh, try and help people get better at the game without altogether roasting the ever-living hell out of them. Which I think is probably the most comfortable way to learn the game. A fair bit of elbowing is, uh, you know, always to be expected, but just part of being com competitive, I suppose. Zarm rolling forward. Yeah, you can see the hesitancy here. We don't want to lose a lot of these squishy units, the Banishers or the Quakers or anything like that. Oh, there's no Quakers here. It's actually just Banisher. The Banishers are quite nice. Yeah, you can see just how quickly they bursted down that Zar. Yeah, the Zar is down, and actually you have a winning number of tanks here. These heavy tanks are so, so durable. We have 57, my goodness, 57 tanks in total. It's uh, 46 tanks for the... Oh, 46 tanks for the red team here. Meanwhile, in the back line, the Shuriken Cloud. <laughs> I guess becoming a more popular strategy as of late. The Shuriken Cloud is now populating the back line over here, blasting away at whatever it can, trying to paralyze, well, for now, a metal extractor. I really don't think that's where we should prioritize, though. Going after the labs, going after the build power, going after basically everything else is probably a good idea. Bombers working on that Aphis. They do indeed get it right over here. The bombers go down for it. That's not the end of the world. Yeah, sure, it can send all over the place. I would love to see these focusing down the economies. If you take down the Aphises, you take down the Fusions, you take down the E-Converters, it essentially shuts off power for all of these units here. And especially for Armada Commanders, if you punish an Armada Commander with an E-Stall, it can really cripple those laser-intensive army compositions. Sharpshooters as well benefit from uh, having energy, or rather they, they need energy in order to fire. Starlights just as well need a lot of energy in order to fire, so... If you, uh, if you could shut down all their power production, you've effectively crippled an Armada Commander. Sumos and Mammoths would be the counterpart to the Cortex side, I suppose. They would be uh, much much reliant on that power production as well. It's just that usually we see Sheldons and Fiends and that sort of stuff, and those aren't nearly as heavily reliant on a lot of that. Banishers, things like that. No laser weaponry. These ambassadors over here have been phenomenal for breaking down the static defense line. You can see the bulwark has fallen already, and all of these uh, starlights that are standing still are going to get obliterated as well. Beautifully done. Rocket trucks, so easy to forget, but so crucial to breaking down a lot of static defense lines. Obviously, overkill against T1 over here. A couple of Mauser would have effectively the same reach and the same destructive capabilities, but still very potent, very powerful. And if you keep them out of harm's way, they can do a whole lot of work for you. Bombers flying over the anti-air. Fighters. More, uh, more fragile, I suppose, deciding they're uh, more interested in staying alive. <laughs> gonna be gonna be trying to avoid the anti air here. I think it's probably a good idea. I would love to see some bl some uh, splits here. We only need about, I think it's six heavy bombers in order to take down one of these aphises. It'll be zero, though, in this case. Uh, interesting. Surprising. On a T1 headed forward here. Yeah, it's unsurprisingly not going to have much of an effect here. We're just flooding the markets with T1 right now. Ugh, I don't quite like it. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, we have, weirdly enough, we have a Blitz factory just producing a bunch of Blitzes on standby. What are the bombers going after here? 
seemingly refusing to drop their payload. There we go. Finally, the bombers pull the trigger and pop the economy right there for Leila and Leila. She loses the entire factory, all the build power, energy converters, and advanced fusion reactors go down. A single demon was produced right here. Unfortunately, not going to be enough in order to change the tide of the front lines here. We already have so many of these starlights out. They're going to be great for dealing with that uh, demon once it hits the front line. Catapult going to be pretty good for pushing them back, though. Catapult's quite dangerous to deal with, but already huge amounts of damage right here from the bombing runs that have been sent across the map right now from the Gave Me Fire. Definitely keeping in mind that we need to think about end games here. Working towards a solution, and uh, part of that has to be how to close out a match. Mammoth line up on the front line here. Sturdy as all hell and incredibly difficult to punch through. Heavy tanks would have a much better time running past the mammoths than actually engaging them head on here. The only saving grace for these tanks is the fact that the mammoths have a hard time shooting over the corpses of their brethren so they can sort of take cover. Still though, that advantage is not big enough that it matters all too much here. Those mammoths are going to continue blasting away here with the support of the ambassadors to fire from a long distance and the bulls in the back line as well for some AoE damage and all those bombers clouding the sky. It's not going to be long before, indeed, the, the uh, red team decides to tap out here. GG is called as the blue team snatches victory with some killer bombing runs, some excellent frontline shenanigans, loads of static defense all over the place, and overall, just a nice, solid, sturdy push. Beautifully done by the blue team. If you enjoy these daily Beyond Our Reason casts, I'd sure appreciate it if you consider subscribing to Brightworks. We're just about to hit 6,000 community members, and I would love to release some statistics because I think they're pretty awesome, and I want to show all you guys that, so I feel like I'll do that as a 6,000 subscriber special. Other than that, though, I sure hope, regardless of whether you choose to join up or be a traitorous coward, uh, as it were, I hope that you have a great rest of your day, and I will see you in the very next game of Beyond All Reason. Peace out, everybody.